everybody. Welcome. My name's Michelle Doherty. I'm going to tell you about uh, my involvement in the Cassini spacecraft mission to Saturn. Can we maybe lower the lights down a little at the front so we can see the slides a bit better? Can you guys see okay? I can't see from here. No. <laughs> Someone slipped into the room back. Ah, oh, perfect. It just means that you're not allowed to snore if you fall asleep, okay? Okay, so um, I'm Michelle Doherty, and I, I was involved in the Cassini spacecraft mission from the time it was launched back in 1997 until the end of the mission, which took place last year, and we're still actively looking at the data. So I'm going to try and give you some highlights of the mission. Uh, in half an hour, I can't tell you everything, of course, but hopefully I'll, I'll pick some of the things that are the most interesting for you. So I like to start with this view of Saturn because... It was a view which was taken by the Cassini spacecraft. It wasn't a single image. It was lots of different images that were put together over a long period of time. But it allows you to see Saturn in all its glory. You can see the rings of Saturn beautifully. You can see one of the rings, this diffuse ring, I've got, I've, I'm showing it to you on the right-hand side here, which is known as the E-ring. And one of the reasons I particularly like this E-ring is there's a little moon embedded in it called Enceladus. And this moon is the moon that my team discovered a rather strange atmosphere on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Enceladus. The other reason I like to show this image, and I don't know if you can see it. I certainly can't see it from here. Let me see if I can move and see it. But those of you with very good eyesight will spot that there is a planetary body just there and that's the Earth. And so this is a view of us which was taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it was orbiting around Saturn. So to be involved in a planetary mission as large as Cassini, you need to have lots of different countries involved. And so this slide here shows you the flags of all of the different countries involved. There were scientists and engineers from all of these countries. Um, and it also gives you a rather nice view of the spacecraft as well. So the instrument that I was responsible for was called the magnetometer. And what that instrument did, and I still have to get used to talking in the past tense rather than in the present tense, but what that instrument did, it measured the magnetic field in the vicinity of the spacecraft. But what we always do with missions like that is you try and get the instrument as far away from the spacecraft as you can. So the magnetic field you measure is due to the environment you're in and not due to the spacecraft itself. So what we did is we put the instrument on this very long boom here, which was 11 meters in length. One of them was put halfway down, and the other one was put at the end. And that was to make sure that we didn't measure any noise that was generated by the spacecraft. This white umbrella-shaped thing here was called the high-gain antenna. And once a day, the high-gain antenna would point down, point at the Earth and it would send data down over an eight-hour period, and that was data that was collected on the previous day. Other thing that you might, two other things you might notice is the spacecraft is covered in a gold foil. That's known as a thermal blanket, and what that thermal blanket does is it keeps the instruments and the spacecraft at temperatures that they can actually operate at. And then last but not least, there's this little funny-shaped object here, which was called the Huygens probe. And this was built by the European Space Agency. And this Huygens probe was, probe was detached from the Cassini spacecraft. And it actually traveled down through the atmosphere of Titan and landed on the surface of Titan. So this here shows you a view of the Cassini spacecraft in the, spa in the vacuum chamber before launch. What we needed to do was to test that the instruments in the spacecraft could survive the vacuum of space. But also, they were subject to the extreme range of temperatures that they encountered. It took us a very long time to get to Saturn. We actually flew past other planets in the solar system to get out to Saturn. And one, one of the flybys was a Venus flyby where the temperature was about plus 50 degrees Celsius. Out at Saturn, the temperature was about minus 170 degrees Celsius. And so the instrument needed to survive those ranges of temperatures. And you can see people standing in this vacuum chamber. So it gives you an idea about how large the spacecraft is. It was two stories tall. 
It weighed seven tons. And other thing you'll notice is my, my boom, my magnetometer boom doesn't seem to be there. And that's because you can't launch a spacecraft with a large boom sticking off from the side. And so that was actually folded away into that canister there. And after the spacecraft was launched, the boom was deployed and we started taking data. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is measurements that the magnetometer made. Now, what a magnetometer does is it measures the magnetic field. But you can't see the magnetic field. You only know it's there because you can measure it and because it has an influence on other things that are going on around it. This here shows you a view of the Earth where you have a magnetic field generated in the interior, just like we have at Saturn. And if you were able to see the magnetic field lines of the Earth, this is what they would actually look like. One way to think about it is if you had a piece of paper, you put a bar magnet, a dipole magnet, underneath that piece of paper, and you had iron filings on top, those iron filings would lie along the lines of force of the magnet. And so that's essentially what you've got at the Earth and what you've got at Saturn as well. Now, one of the things you'll need to keep in mind when I show you the data um, is that just like the Earth does, Saturn rotates on its axis once a day, and those red field lines rotate at the same rate. And so if this is a field line, it's going to be moving around with Saturn as it orbits on its axis. And that's one of the things that we'll use when we look at the data that I'm, that I'm going to show you. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the little moon called Enceladus. Now, this, was a, this, was a, this is a moon that's orbiting around Saturn, um, and it's a very small moon. Its diameter is only 500 kilometers, and so we always thought that it was long dead. It had cooled down. Um, it was formed when Saturn formed, and any heat source should have died away. Now, we had two flybys of Enceladus in the beginning of 2005. So what happened was Cassini was launched in 1997, took us six and a half years to get to Saturn. We spent that six and a half years planning the first four years' worth of observations that we were going to make. And the original plan was we would stay in orbit around Saturn for four years. And so that's what we designed the instruments to do. But because they were doing so well and they were so healthy, the mission continued to be extended until uh, last year, and I'll talk about that at the end. And so we got there in July 2004, and about seven months later, we had our first flyby of Enceladus. And there were three that we had in 2005, and these are the flyby distances. And so the first one was just under 1,300 kilometers above the surface, and a month later, there was a second flyby 500 kilometers above the surface. And based on the observations that my instrument made, we persuaded the Cassini project to take us much closer on the third flyby, and I'll show you why we thought that was worth doing. But let's just have a look at the surface of Enceladus for now. One of the first things you'll notice is it looks very young. There are hardly any craters on it at all. There are only a few craters. And this is really different to a moon that's orbiting close by. I'll come back to this slide now. But if we have a look at this schematic here, this shows you a schematic of the Saturn system. So we have Saturn with the visible rings, and then we have these different moons in orbit. Mimas is orbiting around Saturn here, and the surface of Mimas is covered in lots of different craters. Enceladus is quite close by. That's the orbital distance of Enceladus. And Enceladus doesn't seem to have any craters, or not any. It doesn't have very many. And so the implication is is that something has happened at Enceladus to make the surface much younger, to resurface it somehow. So that was something that we had in mind when we first got there. The other thing that we had in mind is that the Pioneer and the Voyager spacecraft, which uh, flew back in the late 70s and the early 80s, flew past Enceladus. And what they saw was the surface of Enceladus made, made up mainly of water ice. Now, that, that diffuse earring I showed you in the very first slide, that is made up of water ice. And so people have long wondered whether Enceladus was somehow the source of the earring, but they didn't know how. Now, we had these two flybys, and we then, um, let me move on, go to this one. I've already talked about this one to you. I think the only point I haven't made on this one is that the earring is, is huge. It essentially extends from the orbit of Enceladus way out to Titan, which you, is off the page here. Now, Titan is the largest moon of Saturn, the only one with an atmosphere, and that's the one where the Huygens probe traveled through the atmosphere and landed on the surface. 
Okay, so we had these two early flybys of Enceladus, and we saw something rather strange in the data. And we weren't quite sure what we were seeing. I was a little concerned to begin with because the spacecraft was moving really quickly when we flew past so that the camera could keep Enceladus in view. And I was worried that maybe we hadn't reconstructed the trajectory of the spacecraft properly. But looking at the data, what we seem to be seeing in our data, and I'm not going to show you the data because you need to be a magnetometer geek to get excited by data. <laughs> I thought I'd show you a schematic instead. What we were seeing was something like this. Now, we have us... There's our eyes looking down on the north pole of Saturn. And so there's the north pole of Saturn. The gold rings are the visible rings of Saturn. And those blue lines are the magnetic field lines of Saturn, rotating around at the same rate that Saturn does. And Enceladus is the little orange ball orbiting around Saturn. Now, if Enceladus was a dead body, the field lines wouldn't see it the field lines would move straight through it. But that isn't what we were seeing. What we saw in our data instead was rather strange. So here we are looking sideways on at Enceladus now. So here's Enceladus. This blue line is the magnetic field line of Saturn moving towards Enceladus. And instead of being able to go right down onto the surface and move through Enceladus, it seemed to be held upstream. It's almost as if Enceladus was a bigger obstacle than its visible surface. And so something was stopping the field lines penetrating down onto the surface. Now, one thing that can do that is if a body has an atmosphere, just like the Earth has an atmosphere. What will happen is the upper regions of the atmosphere become ionized by solar radiation, and that ionized region called the ionosphere doesn't allow the magnetic field lines to penetrate through it. So based on the observations we made from two flybys separated by a month, I put this schematic together here, which essentially shows what we thought we were seeing. What we thought we were seeing is that Enceladus had a large, diffuse atmosphere covering the entire surface that was stopping the Saturn field lines from penetrating down onto the surface. And so I went to the Jet Propulsion Lab armed with this schematic, and with the certainty that we were seeing something weird, and I made the case to the project that they should take us really close on the subsequent flyby, which was about three months after this. Now, this was a real test of the system because, as I said earlier, we had spent four years planning the six and a half, six and a half years planning the four years we were going to spend originally at Saturn. And so every instrument knew exactly what it was going to do all the time. And we're always a little concerned, what happens if we made a discovery? Would we be able to make a change? And the Cassini project had said to us that we could. And so this was the first test. And I was slightly comforted by the fact when I, when I arrived on the day of the meeting, I went to grab a coffee, and the person standing in the coffee line in front of me was the man who was responsible for the spacecraft, for its safety and for deciding where it was going to go. He was surprised to see me and asked me why I was there, and I told him. And he rubbed his hands together in glee, and he said, oh, that's cool. I want to go closer to a body than anyone else has gone before. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I've got at least one person on the project on my side. So I made a presentation to the scientists, and it was hard going because not everyone was convinced, but there were enough people on the team who thought that what we were seeing was interesting enough that we should make the change. So the plan was made that we would change the flyby altitude of the third flyby from, I think it was planned to be 1,000 kilometers above the surface, to 173 above the surface. And I must confess, I didn't sleep for two or three nights before that flyby, because if we had seen nothing, no one would ever have believed anything that I said again. But I was lucky. What we saw in our data, instead of having an atmosphere covering the entire surface, what we found was that it was focused just at the South Pole. It was almost like a cometary plume coming off a comet as it got close to the sun, and it seemed only to be focused at the South Pole. One of the things I didn't mention is, based on our data, what we also found is there was a great increase of water vapor in the vicinity of Enceladus when we got close by. So we had the bend in the field lines, and we had an increase in water vapor. Now, because we went so close, all the other instruments were able to take very interesting data as well. And I'm going to show you data from, from two of those, three of those, actually. This here shows you, top left, shows you a picture that was taken by the visual camera on board Cassini 
where if you look at the South Pole here, you can see cracks at the surface, blue cracks at the surface, and the imaging team called those tiger stripes. Bottom left, we have data that was taken by an instrument that was able to remotely sense the temperature of the body. What they expected to see was that the warmest temperature was at the equator, because that's where the solar radiation is strongest. But instead, what they found was that the hottest temperature was at the South Pole. There seemed to be a hot spot at the South Pole. Now, when I say hot spot, this is all relative, because it's like minus 170 degrees Celsius out there. And so the hot spot was at a balmy minus 100 degrees Celsius. But this was telling you that there was internal heat within Enceladus that was leaking out. And so if you overlay this temperature map on top of the visual image here, the hottest spot of 91 degrees Kelvin, so minus 100 degrees Celsius, thereabouts, was right over one of the cracks. And so it's clear that the crack on the surface was leading into the interior and internal heat was leaking out. And this was where the water vapor was coming out from. So the implication seemed to be that there was a liquid water ocean under the surface of Enceladus and under the deep pressure, water vapor was leaking out. So we got really excited, but there were other data sets as well, which made it even more exciting. This shows you a view taken by the imager on board the spacecraft a few months later when it turned back and looked at Enceladus. And you can clearly see how large the water vapor plume was. And those different colors show you different densities. And it extends about 100 kilometers above the surface. This slide here shows you a zoomed in view over the cracks. The colors show you the heat leaking out, and yellow is hottest. And these little stars that you can see here are individual sources. One of the things that we found was as Enceladus was orbiting around Saturn, the gravitational field on Enceladus changed in its orbit because the orbit is not quite circular. And so it seemed to be that as the tidal forces, the gravitational forces were changing, different parts of the cracks were opening and closing. And so there was a different amount of water vapor leaking out at different times. Oh, and this, this is a size of what 50 kilometers is. And so it gives, just gives you an understanding about how, how big the region is that we're actually looking at there. But really, the, the final reason as to why everyone got so excited about Enceladus was because we found organic material. There was an instrument on board Cassini called the Iron Neutral Mass Spectrometer. And what that was able to do is, as, as we flew through the plume, which you can see here in blue, it almost was able to taste the plume. It could tell what was in the material. And these are some of the ingredients that it found. There was methane. There was water vapor, but we knew that because we had seen that in our data. There was carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. And there was simple and complex organic material. And so this was when planetary scientists became really excited about Enceladus as a place for potential habitability. You need four things for life to form. You need liquid water, which we have at Enceladus. You need a heat source, which we've seen. You need there to be organic material. And the fourth thing you need is for those first three to be stable over a long enough period of time that something can happen. That's the fourth thing that we're not sure about. We don't know how long these conditions have been at Enceladus. But Enceladus is now one of the places in the, in the solar system where there is a focus on has life been there in the past? Is there bacteria in the ocean at the moment? And so based on these observations, in the extended Cassini missions that we, mission that we had, we eventually had 30 different flybys past Enceladus, and there are now plans to send future spacecraft to Enceladus. Going into orbit is difficult, though, because its gravitational force is rather low, and so you need a huge amount of fuel to be able to go into orbit. Now, before I start talking a little bit about the end of the Cassini mission, I just wanted to talk very briefly about another mission that we're building an instrument for, and that's known as the JUICE spacecraft mission, and that's going to Jupiter. And the reason we want to do that is because four of Jupiter's moons are very interesting. These are the four large moons. They're named after the scientist Galileo, so they're known as the Galilean moons. Io in the top left is a, is a moon that's got sulfur volcanoes on the surface. We're not going anywhere near Io, 
we don't want to zap our spacecraft when it first arrives. So we're going to focus on these three moons here, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And those blue regions that you can see in the interior is liquid water. So all three of those moons have got liquid water underneath the surface. Ganymede for a magnetometer is the place to go because Ganymede's the only moon in the solar system that has an internal dynamo. So if you stood on the surface of Ganymede, just like you stand on the surface of the Earth and you had a compass, the compass needle would point to the North Pole. And so we're actually going to go into orbit around Ganymede, work out why it's got a magnetic field, but also measure the currents that flow in the ocean, because those currents are going to be able to tell us not only how deep the ocean is, but what its salt content is, so how conductive the ocean is. And this is all going to be done by a spacecraft called JUICE, and this shows you an artist's impression of, Ganymede, of JUICE going into orbit around Ganymede. JUICE is going to use solar power, so you can see the solar panels here. And in fact, last night I got a f an email from the project manager on JUICE, which showed us a photograph of the first model of the spacecraft being put into the vacuum chamber to be tested. And that made the hair on my arm stand up on end, because this is going to be launched in 2022, It'll get to Jupiter in 2030. I won't tell you how old I'll be. <laughs> but some of the younger members in the audience hopefully will be working on the data from 2030 and beyond. So let me in the last eight minutes or so focus on the end of mission. So the Cassini spacecraft was due to orbit around Saturn for four years, but because it was doing so well and it was so healthy, it kept being extended. So in the end, it was there for 13 years. And it was beginning to run out of fuel. And we knew that was going to happen. And we wanted to ensure that the end of the mission was good for us scientifically as well as killing the spacecraft safely. We didn't want the spacecraft to crash land on Enceladus because if life was ever found there in the future, there might be questions raised because a man-made or person-made object landed on the surface. So what we decided to do was to burn it up in the atmosphere of Saturn. And we, we did that because we wanted to try and understand the internal structure of Saturn better. And there were two different phases to it. There was the, so here's Saturn here. This circle here is the orbit of Titan, which is 20 planetary radii away from Saturn. And what we did is we used Titan as a gravity assist and it got the spacecraft up out of the equatorial plane. So the first phase were known as the ring grazing orbits, and here the closest approach was just beyond the edge of the visible rings. And then we moved into the final phase, which was known as the grand finale orbits, these blue ones, and there the closest approach was just above the cloud tops. And then the final orbit is that orange one, which you can see there, and on that final orbit the spacecraft burnt up in the atmosphere. This shows you a zoomed-in view of, of those, those close approaches. So it was, it was in the gap between the rings and the atmosphere. And the other reason I like to show this is it actually confirms clearly that the, the rings are not solid. When you have a look at pictures of Saturn's rings, they look as though they're solid objects, but they're not. They're made up of countless individual particles, each in their own orbit. And so you can, you can just make out the trajectory of the spacecraft through the rings. Now, there were two instruments which drove this end of these end of mission orbits, and that was the magnetometer instrument, but also the gravity instrument as well. Because we don't understand the magnetic field of Saturn. We don't understand how it's generated, and we need to get really close to be able to do that. One of the things that we can do is the magnetic field lines that we measure outside of the planet essentially allows you to work out what's going on inside. So we think they're generated by the planetary dynamo process. So you have fast rotation taking place. You have an overturning convective motion, a bit like porridge, bub you know, sort of bubbling away on the stove. You have heat being given off. And those processes combine to form the planetary dynamo. But what planetary dynamo theory tells you is that the rotation axis of the planet and the magnetic axis have a tilt between them. You can't generate the magnetic field if you don't have a tilt. At Saturn, we can't find a tilt. And so we don't know how the planetary dynamo can form. We think it forms as usual and then something is masking its, 
its effect outside, but that's why we wanted to get really close. We're still working on the data. We think we're seeing a tilt, but it's really tiny, and we, we, we've still got a lot more work to do on the data. But that gives you an idea about how close we got. And so I actually went out to the Jet Propulsion Lab for the first final orbit. So this was back in April last year. And I remember bumping into the project manager just before the first end of mission orbit started, and you could see he was looking really nervous. We weren't quite sure what was going to happen. The spacecraft and the instruments were not designed to do this. We were going to fly through this supposedly empty gap, but we didn't know if it was empty. We th thought there might be some energetic dust particles which might have hit the spacecraft. And so what we did is we flew with the spacecraft having its high-gain antenna in front of it. So we flew with the high-gain antenna in the direction of travel to protect the instruments and the spacecraft from any energetic dust. That was fine for the other instruments. You know where my instrument was. <laughs> it was on this long boom. And so he came up to me and he said, oh, I, I think we're going to be okay. I'm not sure about you, but I think the rest <laughs> of the instruments are going to be okay. And so I thanked him kindly and sat and bit my nails as we watched it happen. But it survived the first one, and it survived all 22 of them. I still can't believe that it did because it wasn't designed to do it. We were running out of fuel, and I was really worried it wasn't going to get to the end. But it went through all 22, and the end of the mission occurred on the 15th of September of last year, and that's where it happened. This, this is a view that was taken by the visual imaging map, mapping spectrometer on board Cassini, which was able to, to view the infrared heat of Saturn. So the color you can see is the heat coming from the interior. The black are the clouds of Saturn. And that little white oval is where Cassini burnt up. And just to put it into context, it happened just above the equatorial plane of Saturn. Now, the final slide I have before I show you the end of mission movie is a picture that was taken in the mission control room after the end of mission. We've been working on Cassini for over 20 years, and so we didn't quite realize how we were going to feel at the end of mission. And even now, the, I, I get goosebumps when I think about it. But watching this was hard. But for me, I think the most poignant moment was as we were coming towards the end of the mission, there was a, a line on a plot that was telling us that the spacecraft was talking to the Earth and sending data down to the Earth. Because what we did at the end is we oriented the medium gain antenna to point at the Earth so we could send data down as we went into the atmosphere. And in fact, my instrument took the last bit of data about a second before we burnt up. But we were watching this line on a plot, and while it was there, all was well. And it disappeared and we thought that was it, and then it came back again. And that coming back again was the spacecraft trying to keep talking. The spacecraft hadn't been told it was going to burn up. And so it thought, oh, I'm losing contact with the Earth, so it reoriented itself so it would, could continue to talk, and then it disappeared for the final time. So to end, let me show you the end of mission movie. And there should be sound too. to reveal the grandeur of Saturn, its rings and moons. After 20 years in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft is running out of fuel. And so, to protect moons of Saturn, I could have conditions suitable for life. A spectacular end has been planned for this long-lived traveler from Earth. Following a seven-year journey through the solar system, Cassini arrived at Saturn. That's why we're on attitude and point position. Light up the rocket. Up the spacecraft carried a passenger, the European Huygens probe, the first human-made object to land on a world in the distant outer solar system. Huygens arrived in the 
over a decade, Cassini has shared the wonders of Saturn and its family of icy moons, taking us to astounding worlds where methane rivers run to a methane sea, where jets of ice and gas are blasting material into space from a liquid water ocean that might harbor the ingredients for life. And Saturn, a giant world ruled by raging storms and delicate harmonies of gravity. Now, Cassini has one last daring assignment. Cassini's grand finale is a brand new adventure. 22 dives through the space between Saturn and its rings. As it repeatedly braves this unexplored region, Cassini seeks new insights about the origins of the rings and the nature of the planet's interior, closer to Saturn than ever before. Final orbit, Cassini will plunge into Saturn, fighting to keep its antenna pointed at Earth as it transmits its farewell. In the skies of Saturn, the journey ends. As Cassini becomes part of the planet itself. Thank you very much. So I think we have some time for questions. I've been told we've got 10 minutes. Yes, I have a question from the front. Um, how did he die? Hmm? How did he die? He just burnt. I'm afraid. But it... It wasn't a person, thank goodness. It was just a spacecraft. Oh, just. It was a, it was a beautiful <laughs> spacecraft. <laughs> One over there. Yes. Because it might not be water ice. It might be a different kind of ice. Um, those, those internal views were based on uh, gravity and magnetic field data taken from the Galileo spacecraft. But we think by going into orbit, we can use other instrumentation to try and work out the depth and also maybe potentially what the, co what the actual composition is. Um, because we'll have instruments that can, that can see what the composition on the surface is, and we might then be able to project it down a bit. Yeah. Yes. Is it oxygen we know peaks around the planet? I'm sorry, is it? Uh, oxygen. 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 Is it peaks uh, around the planet? Uh, we know everything about oxygen in space. Is, is the Saturn? Um, I mean the moon. Uh, we didn't, there's no, there wasn't much, ox much, much oxygen at all. It was mainly, well, it was water vapor um, and water c vapor constituents. Um, so it was hydrogen and oxygen, but in water vapor form. Yeah. Yes. We think so. We think so. We, because, because the orbit of Enceladus is not circular, um, on some occasions, it's, it's closer to Saturn than on, than on others. So when it's closer, the gravitational force is strongest, and so that's what helps keep the, it keeps the interior molten. Um, so we think, we think it's tidal forces. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 
you'd have to keep ducking small particles and big ones. Um, they, they, they range from micron-sized dust to little, to little moons. They're, they're small moonlets in the rings that there's some spectacular images that Cassini took where, or movies that Cassini took where you can actually watch these little moonlets orbiting with inside the rings and it actually causes waves on the edge of the rings. So they range from micron size to large boulder size and then moon size bodies. Gravitational and, cent and centrifugal force, it, it, it forces them into, into, a, a thin, into a thin region. Yeah. Right at the back. My, my sole research focus was Cassini. Um, but I also was doing teaching as well. Um, and because I was responsible for the team, not only was I worrying about my own research, but you want to try and make sure that the team is covering as much as you can. We also spent a lot of our time planning the observations that we were going to make. So it was, it was a full-time job. And um, now that it's over, I'm actually spending more time doing science on it than I was while it was going on because I don't have to worry about the other things. Yeah. Yes. Is that the NASA launch pad for the Land Rover telescope? No. NASA wants to land something on Europa, which is one of Jupiter's moons. They do want to go back to Enceladus, but it's really hard because I think, as I mentioned in the talk, because Enceladus is so small, its gravitational field is very small. So you need a huge amount of fuel to force the spacecraft to go into orbit. And we don't have a rocket big enough yet to launch it with enough fuel to do that. So we, might, we, we, we can fly past it, but getting into orbit is going to be difficult. Yes. It's the same as it was on Cassini. I'm responsible for the magnetometer. Um, and for me, it's really interesting because on Cassini, I became involved around the time of launch, and so I wasn't involved in the build phase. And so now the focus is persuading the people building the spacecraft to allow us to build the instrument we want to build, to do the science we want. Because, you know, the European Space Eng Agency engineers want to build the best spacecraft possible, and the, sci the scientists are a nuisance because it's making them change how they build the spacecraft. So it's a very different interaction, and it's interesting for me to do that. Yeah. Yes. European Space Agency involvement is completely separate to Brexit. We pay a yearly subscription to the European Space Agency, and non-European countries do as well. Canada is involved in ESA as well. So I'm not concerned about ESA involvement, but we have lost some, some good engineers who've gone, who are going to go back to Europe. So I am concerned about it on another front as well. Yes. Well, I, I didn't choose that. I said to them, we'd like to go really close. Um, they weren't prepared to go any closer. Although on, uh, a fly, uh, on a subsequent flyby three years later, they flew 25 kilometers above the surface. And they said they would never do that again <laughs> because the density of the plume was quite high and the magnetometer boom made the spacecraft unstable. Um, but what I found really interesting was watching the, the people responsible for effectively driving the spacecraft. They be got... Be, be they became a lot more confident in the spacecraft's ability over time. It was almost like learning how to drive a new car. You have to drive it for a while to realize what it can do. And so we would never have done the end of mission orbits if they'd been right at the start because they wouldn't have thought the spacecraft could do it. Yes. Yes. The way that it works is scientists want to go everywhere. And so what you do is you put, you put proposals together and you, you, you make a suggestion. Um, and so we did Saturn first, and now we're doing Jupiter.
although a lot of people now want to go back to Saturn, of course. And I say, let's just understand the Cassini data first. Yes, another one. Of course, always a risk. You would have loved to have seen it first. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I think, I don't think NASA should send a lander to Europa yet. We need to work out where the ice crust is thinnest and get as close as we can to that, but not on that spot because we don't want to fall through that. There's a, there's a movie called The Europa Report where exactly that happens. They send the spacecraft and all these people to Europa and it lands on one of the weakest points and they get sucked in. It's a very sad <laughs> movie. <laughs> but, <laughs> I thought I saw one more hand, yes. There were two different fuel sources. There was radioisotopes and they um, kept the instruments going. Um, but there was also rocket fuel and it's the rocket fuel that we ran out of because the rocket fuel was used to fire the spacecraft engine and change its orientation. And in fact, we were on the fumes at the end. That was one of the reasons why we weren't sure if we get all the way through to the end. Yeah. Brian. <laughs> Yes, the technologies change, and it is a bit frustrating because, you know, the instrument on Cassini was rather large. The computer on board couldn't handle more than two gigabytes of data a day. Um, but the instrument we're building for JUICE has changed slightly, but not... And the reason for that is when you fly instruments on planetary missions like this, they need to reach a certain technology readiness level. And... The only way that they can do that is to have flown before. And so even if we did have an idea for a new instrument, we couldn't fly it on the JUICE spacecraft because it hasn't flown in that environment before. And you need, you know that the old technologies work. You know, I had two instruments on Cassini. One of them stopped working a year after we got there. And that's why you need instruments that are solid and redundant and stable. So it's a, it's a, it's a balance between flying the new sort of the new sort of gizmo from your phone and flying something that you know is going to survive for 13 years. But it is a bit frustrating that you can't put a cell phone on that'll take all the pictures you like. <laughs> yes, another one. Uh, one last question. Of course. Not life like us. I think there might be, be bacteria there, but it would be too cold for us. It doesn't have enough gravity to keep us on the surface. And so it, it was, when Cassini was launched, I was out at Cape Canaveral for the launch, and we never knew Enceladus was going to be so interesting. Everyone thought Titan was going to be the interesting moon. And the Huygens probe was going to travel down and land on the surface of Titan. And I remember there was a, there was a little skit in the newspaper the day after the, after the launch which showed a little green person standing on the surface of Titan. And the next image showed the Huygens probe landing on the surface and squashing that person dead. <laughs> and the third picture showed a sign that said, welcome to Titan, population equals one. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful. If you, if you send an instrument or a probe to, a, to land somewhere, you need to make sure that you know where you're going to go and that, that, the that the spacecraft doesn't take bacteria with it. And so to land somewhere makes much more expensive. You've got to put the spacecraft through so many more different tests to be able to do it. I have a lady standing at the back pointing at her watch at me. I think we can go to the back. There's a little room. I think I've, I'm going to go there if you want to come and chat a bit more. But thank you very much. <laughs>